Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. It was quite a Jewish year, 2019. In Israel, a second round of national elections failed to produce the next coalition government, as both Mr. Netanyahu and General Benny Gantz each failed to put together a government of more than 61 seats. And as Israel appears spiraling towards a third try at a national election, the current acting prime minister, Mr. Netanyahu, is under criminal indictment for bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. On the American political scene, which seems every bit as chaotic, a number of events have raised questions over whether Israel's bipartisan support is eroding within the Democratic Party, led by first-time Congresswomen Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, Rashid Talib of Michigan, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York. Earlier this year, Ilhan Omar uttered the infamous line, it's all about the Benjamins, baby, suggesting GOP congressional support for Israel is driven by campaign donations from major Jewish organizations such as APAC. Both Representative Omar and Representative Talib explicitly expressed their support of the BDS movement, a Palestinian-led hate movement of boycotts, divestment, sanctions against the state of Israel, which seek nothing less than the total destruction of the Jewish state. An attempt to censure Omar for her anti-Semitic tropes was defeated twice in the Democratic-held House of Representatives, and a House declaration condemning anti-Semitism had to be changed to a reference to hate speech in general. In August, after Omar Talib and Cortez refused to join the standard congressional fact-finding mission to Israel, the three announced they were planning their own trip to Palestine without including any meetings or talks with Israeli officials. When Israel's interior minister, Arye Deri, learned of the nature and goal of their visit, he refused to issue a travel visa to the three congresswomen, a decision many felt was motivated by Donald Trump's tweeting that Israel would look weak if it allowed the trio of haters to enter Israel. And a huge brouhaha ensued in Israel as well as within American Jewry, criticizing Israel's barring three members of Congress from entering the country. When Minister Derry said he would permit Talib to visit the West Bank, Talib refused the offer. Speaking of Donald Trump in Israel, the president continued to take diplomatic steps in support of Israel's sovereignty over areas that came under Israel's control as a result of the defensive six-day war of 1967. The president formally accepted Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, where Prime Minister Netanyahu unveiled the name of a new Jewish community on the Golan Heights to be named Ramat Trump. President Trump has been actively involved in the Middle East and unveiled the first phase of his peace plan at a major conference in Bahrain. The two-day workshop called Peace to Prosperity outlined plans to raise $50 billion in investment into the Palestinian community as economic incentives for the Palestinians to abandon their irredentist goal of annihilating Israel. Unfortunately, the Palestinian leadership boycotted the conference. And then, in a dramatic decision this November that caught most people by surprise, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced that the administration does not define Israeli settlements as illegal. In response, 107 members of Congress, all Democrats, wrote a letter in stern rebuke to Secretary Pompeo, expressing their strong disagreement with the State Department's decision to reverse decades of bipartisan policy on settlements, ending their opposition, in essence, to the President's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, to his closing the Palestinian mission in Washington, and to his cutting aid to the Palestinians on the West Bank and Gaza. The Democrats' letter charged that the President's action undermined the credibility of the U.S. to act as an honest broker 
and went so far as to say that his policies were endangering the security of America. And in a highly partisan vote, the Democratic-controlled House passed a resolution endorsing the two-state solution, again seen as an act of defiance of Trump policy, which seems prepared to accept the fact that Israel might annex the entire West Bank. Donald Trump has also taken steps to help Jews domestically in the battle against anti-Semitism by signing an executive order reclassifying Jews as a nationality or ethnicity rather than as a religion so that the government can penalize schools financially if they don't combat anti-Semitism. Meanwhile, in a Democratic Party primary contest, Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont is arguing that the U.S. should withhold billions of dollars promised in financial assistance to Israel unless Israel changes its policies, referring specifically to what Senator Sanders described as Israeli racism of the Netanyahu government. Another frontrunner, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, was also specific in her conditional financial support of Israel, saying she is open to making U.S. aid to the Jewish state conditional on whether the government ceases building in the West Bank. Mayor Pete Buttigieg of South Bend also echoed Warren's consideration of withholding aid to Israel. Only former Vice President Joe Biden took a strong stand in Israel's defense, calling it outrageous to leverage financial aid to pressure Israel on its settlement policy. And while the Democratic field of presidential hopefuls seems to be lacking a strong, moderate, viable candidate, the former three-term mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, did an about-face and decided to use his immense fortune in a bid to win the Democratic nomination. Interestingly, his Jewishness does not seem to be a problem with voters, but his wealth as a billionaire has provoked strong criticism from other candidates led by Bernie Sanders. It should also be noted that the efforts to impeach President Trump in the House of Representatives have been led by high-profile Jews, Adam Schiff of California and Jerry Nadler of New York. In some right-wing circles, some evangelical extremists are calling the efforts to remove Donald Trump from office via impeachment as a Jew coup, a blatantly anti-Semitic canard. In the halls of academia, virulent anti-Semitism, masquerading as merely anti-Zionism, continues to dominate some of America's elite schools, exemplified by anti-Israel groups at Duke University, SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, and the Coalition for Peace with Justice, took part in an anti-Israel conference where anti-Semitic propaganda were the major themes of the day. SJP made videos available on the Duke campus featuring Palestinians claiming that Israel targets innocent black and brown people for torture and death. Meanwhile, Hamas continued its assault on Israel at the Gaza border, and when Israel assassinated a leader of Hamas terrorism, Hamas fired hundreds of rockets into the Jewish state. When Israel retaliated, Israel came under heavy criticism from, again, Democratic candidates of their party, and again it was Bernie Sanders who made the strongest comment saying, what is going on in Gaza right now is absolutely inhumane, it is unacceptable, it is unsustainable. Sanders went on to say that some of the money earmarked for Israel should go to humanitarian aid in Gaza instead. At J Street's annual convention, Senator Sanders was cheered for his position, reflecting the growing division within the American Jewish community. Sadly, the long-standing Jewish commitment to the principle of free speech seems less important. Alan Dershowitz, one of the nation's historic defenders of civil liberties, and perhaps the most ardent defender of the state of Israel, has become a pariah in liberal circles because even though he voted for Hillary Clinton and has no love for Donald Trump's presidency, he argues against impeaching President Trump on matters of principle and law. And a liberal bastion on the American Jewish scene, the renowned 92nd Street Y, 
has actually banned Professor Dershowitz from giving his annual address in support of Israel, supposedly because of his unsubstantiated charges of sexual misconduct, which Dershowitz adamantly claims he has proof of its being false, and because he once legally defended the notorious pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Censorship within social media giants, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube also spilled onto Jews. YouTube took a number of videos down produced by conservative commentator Ben Shapiro and author and talk show host Dennis Prager. And to our shock here at JBS, YouTube removed an address I gave on what it means to be an American Zionist today on the grounds that it was hate speech, a decision YouTube thankfully reversed. Nor is America the only place experience excesses from both the left and the right. In Europe, the Jewish communities of France and Belgium and even Denmark, which had a sterling record of protecting Jews during the Holocaust, have become home to a scary form of anti-Semitism. Significant numbers of French families are making Aliyah each year. Of course, the worst anti-Semitic event in the Jewish year took place on April 27, 2019, the last day of Passover, when a crazed gunman entered the Chabad synagogue in Poway, California, and wantonly murdered 60-year-old Lori Gilbert Kay, wounding three others, including the Chabad rabbi Yisrael Goldstein, whom witnesses say was saved when Lori Gilbert Kay threw her body between the rabbi and the murderer. This ultimate anti-Semitic violence hit the Jewish community especially hard as we were still healing from the murder of 11 Jews in Pittsburgh's Tree of Life congregation, which occurred six months earlier, in October of 2018. Nor is it the only violent act perpetrated on Jews. The Hasidic community of Brooklyn has experienced a series of attacks, and the recent shooting in Jersey City in a kosher supermarket that took the lives of three Jews and a policeman also seems to be a Jewish hate crime. But there are also many happy and uplifting moments in the Jewish year, including Natan Sharansky's winning this year's Genesis Prize in Israel of $1 million. Israel became a major player in space exploration, sending the spacecraft Bereshit to the moon. Although a malfunction at the very moment of landing on the moon's surface called Bereshit to crash upon landing, a most disappointing moment for all who had assembled to watch the landing live, Israel is only the fourth nation in the world to reach the moon, and Israel Aerospace Industry promises the next time the landing will be smooth. Harvard professor Michael Kremer won this year's Nobel Prize in Economics. 204 Jews have been awarded a Nobel Prize, accounting for 22% of all Nobel laureates. On May 8th of this year, the anniversary of VE Day in 1945, George Klein's groundbreaking traveling exhibition on the horrors of Auschwitz debuted in the United States at New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, entitled Auschwitz, Not Long Ago, Not Far Away, features more than 700 original objects and 400 photographs, mainly from the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum including an actual boxcar used to transport some of the 1.3 million Jews who went to that extermination camp. 960,000 Jews died at Auschwitz-Birkenau. The National Book Council announced its list of winners in 2018, including the Jewish Book of the Year entitled Hunting the Truth, Memoirs of Beat and Serge Klarsfeld, who tell the story of their Nazi hunting over a 50-year period. Ehud Barak won the nonfiction prize for his memoir, My Country, My Life, Fighting for Israel, Searching for Peace. And Jack Wertheimer won in the field of American Jewish Studies with his sociological study entitled The New American Judaism, How Jews Practice Their Religion Today. And Daniel Gordis came out with another somewhat controversial book on the increasingly straining relationship between American Jewry and the State of Israel, 
It's called We Stand Divided, The Rift Between American Jews and Israel. Also this year at the Golden Globe Awards, Michael Douglas won the Best Actor for his role in the Netflix series The Kaminsky Method. And at the Emmys, Alex Borstein won Best Supporting Actress for her role in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and offered a moving tribute to her Holocaust surviving grandmother, whom she said had the courage to step out of line in a Nazi concentration camp, a step which saved her life, enabled her to bring her children and grandchildren into the world. And this month, one of American Jewry's oldest institutions, the Workmen's Circle, went PC and renamed itself Workers' Circle. And that's just some of what energized the Jewish year 2019. I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to our annual Year End Review, where I'll have the joy of being joined by a wonderful panel of friends who will help analyze the events of this past year, offering their perspectives on which events were of most importance and how they will impact Jewish life in the year and years to come. Let me introduce them to you. Thane Rosenbaum is the award-winning novelist and author who now serves as Distinguished University Professor at Turo College in New York. He's the founding director of the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society, and is a columnist for JNS, the Jewish News Syndicate. Rabbi Eric Yaffe is President Emeritus of the URJ, the Union for Reform Judaism, which he guided for some 16 years. Eric is now a columnist whose pieces appear in Haaretz, the Huffington Post, and the Jerusalem Post. And Eric is a frequent scholar in residence throughout the country, and you can read his opinion pieces at ericyaffe.com. Betty Ehrenberg is the executive director for the World Jewish Congress in North America, and Betty is the editor of the WJC's Iran Update. Betty Ehrenberg also served as Executive Director and Director of International Affairs and Communal Relations for the Institute for Public Affairs, the political action and public policy arm of the Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations of America. And Richard Stone, a former chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, which is the umbrella organization for American Jewry. Richard has a long and illustrious career, both in the halls of academia, where he's a professor emeritus at Columbia Law, though he still teaches tax law there, and most especially in the Jewish world, where he's been in leadership positions for the National Council on Soviet Jewry, the New York Jewish Community Relations Council, and many other Jewish bodies. And it is so wonderful for all of you, again, to make time for us here on JBS, to talk about the year in review, thank you so much for being here. So the first question is always the same. Thane, for you, the most significant event in all of the myriad events that took place in the Jewish year 2019, what is it? Well, some of them are related to a few of the uh, items in your recitation of the year. And I think that what ties them together is this extraordinary invasion of the progressive movement within the Democratic Party. Because you could see a number of the items that you listed are all related to the same thing. Um, this is something I think that even people like me and Richard who live in universities, we've seen this coming, but I don't know about Richard. I certainly didn't think we would see it in the mainstream political culture. Uh, the idea, and, and it's happened so fast, that within the last four years, we started off with you know, Bernie Sanders when he was running uh, in the primary against Hillary Clinton, you know, invoking the words disproportionate death, that blaming Israel for Gaza. And then you know, several years later, you have congressional candidates running as socialists. Right? And now you see a, a, an absolute invasion and a, a hijacking of the Democratic Party by a progressive movement that is hostile to Israel, that is anti-Semitic in many different ways, explicitly, not just always indirectly, explicitly, uh, and, and, uh, and a kind of defiance uh, about you know, the, the, the bipartisan connection between Israel and the United okay. States. So for you, the most significant development issue 
it's not necessarily an event, but it's a movement that upsets you for the Jewish world is the uh, change within the, certainly the progressive wing of the Democratic well, Party. Well, the reason this is important, Mark, is because <clears throat> the statistics, statistics have shown since the FDR administration that 80% of American Jewry votes Democratic. And the question is, you have a, 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 a president who many Jews are hostile to, but who's been an incredible benefactor of the state of Israel, and you have a Democratic Party that has been incredibly hostile to Israel and, and embracing avowed anti-Semites. Remember, uh, one of the things that you mentioned so briefly was that when the House was given an opportunity to censure and condemn Congresswoman Omar for her anti-Semitic statements, they chose not to do that. They were afraid to do that. Uh, and in fact, they then just used a general statement against racism. So there is a kind of protection, the same way I would argue, the same way Palestinian violence is protected in the global world, that you can't criticize Palestinians. I think we're seeing very similar elements here in the United States. Okay. Eric, you, unless you are going to mention the same theme as Thane, I want you to hold any response you might have to Thane's comments about the Democratic Party and Jews. I want to know simply from you, if I asked you first, <laughs> Eric, I, you know I'm going to give you time to answer. But first I want to know, Eric, when you look at all of the events, issues, threat, trends of 2019, what's the most significant to you from a Jewish perspective? Okay, I, I'll make no reference to my radical disagreement with what I've just heard from But uh, I'll Thane. give you a chance to do that yes, later. Yes, that, that will come up later. Wait, you and I are radically disagreeing? <laughs> <laughs> the JP audience has never heard that right. here. So it would be easier if I could pick one in either United States or Israel, because as, as I look at the Jewish world, that's how I tend to see things. Making um, that tough choice, if I were to go with one, I think I would go with the indictment of Bibi Netanyahu. And the reason is not, I mean, the indictment in and of itself is obviously significant, and, and it's, a, it's a proud moment for the state of Israel. It's a, it's a declaration that nobody is above the, nobody is above the law. Uh, but it's important for the Jewish world because I believe uh, that it means that the, the uh, Netanyahu era is over. And, uh, and, you, and for you, that's the most significant development of 2019. Yes, because uh, uh, our deep commitment to the state of Israel, it's certainly something we share at this table and shared throughout the Jewish world, the ties between Israel and, and the state of Is uh, and uh, Jews of the United States are extremely important. So uh, the direction that Israel takes, you know, must be uh, um, a major central concern for, for uh, the American Jewish community. Uh, I believe that direction has been set by uh, uh, the Prime Minister, the longest serving Prime Minister in, in Israel's history, 13 years altogether, the last uh, 10 years consecutively. Um, and uh, while we don't know precisely and exactly how things are going to develop over the next mm -hmm. weeks and months, uh, one way or another, I think his, his uh, tenure that remains is going to be very short. And uh, the result is Israel's going to move in different directions. And uh, that's going to have an impact on us all. I believe on balance that will be uh, to the good for the people of Israel and uh, for the Jewish people throughout the world. So it's enormously significant, and I would, would focus on that. Fascinating. Okay. Betty Ehrenberg, your most significant issue, event, trend, what? The announcement from uh, President Trump that, uh, and the State Department that the settlements are, in fact, not illegal, which is something that I have said here before in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that uh, this will make a very big difference, I feel, if maybe not right away, but going forward as um, Israel has always been on the docket in the international community because the settlements have so -called, been so-called illegal, uh, erroneously. Uh, the um, <clears throat> the uh, rectifying uh, uh, the very loud and, um, and uh, vociferous uh, announcement by President Obama when he said the settlements are illegal uh, in Cairo in his first address, you'll remember that, and uh, this has been misused. The people have parroted this, 
all over the place that has been parroted in the media, it has been parroted in academia, uh, and people don't know what they're talking about. And I think that to release Israel from this uh, unfair criticism, this erroneous criticism, uh, in the long run is going to make a difference as uh, we see that it can be used less and less to uh, vilify Israel. I'm not talking about criticism of Israel like we can criticize any democracy, but very often we hear the, oh, the, the Israel policies and uh, the illegal occupation and all of this that, we, that is in fact not right, unfair, and um, is just um, people don't know what they're even saying and is used to uh, uh, blacklist Israel. Thank you, Betty. So Richard, this is the first time you're joining our year-end round table. As you look at 2019, what do you see as the most significant event or trend or issue? Well, first, thank you for inviting me, Mark. I've been waiting for years. <laughs> the, the, uh, I, I'm going to look at this from what I think is a, both a positive and a, a longer-term uh, perspective. Uh, and I'm, my answer would be a, a takeoff, really, on Betty's answer. To me, the most significant events that occurred this year, 20, this calendar year 2019, in terms of the future of the Jewish people, uh, for reasons that I know I'm not allowed to explain yet, but we'll be able to explain at length later, because I have a real um, kind of theory about this, is starts with the announcement by the Trump administration, and I don't want to be misunderstood as supporting or not supporting the Trump administration. It's a fact that they announced this, and I think it was a very important thing and a good thing, and saying nothing else about Trump, because I think that issue should be out of this conversation as much as possible. Uh, to recognize the, is, Israel's uh, annexation of the Golan Heights, and then the announcement that the American government's position is that settlements are not illegal. That's it, not illegal. And I think that is a, a trilogy of announcement that joins the prior year's an, a placement of the embassy in Jerusalem, which I would like to tie together later on when I'm permitted to. Uh, and Along with that, and again, in an integrated theory of my part, is the fact that progress was continued to be made. The Bahrain conference was an indication of it, but that progress continued to be made in securing cooperation and maybe recognition uh, between Israel and the Gulf states, including the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and in, on an ongoing basis, uh, Egypt and, and others. I think in, in, in that grouping of events is part of one major important and perhaps redeeming uh, development that 2019 produced. Okay. It is fascinating that all four of you have slightly different takes, and so I want to talk now about some of the things you've said. First of all, you heard Thane's feeling about the Democratic Party, and Eric, I hear this everywhere I go from committed Democrats, but with the committed Democrats who are also committed Jews. There are, many, there are many Democrats who are Jewish, but whose affiliation with the Jewish community or their commitment to Israel is marginal at best. But I'm talking about people who have been lifelong Democrats, but they feel strongly about Israel. They just don't understand why the grown-ups in the Democratic Party have not in some way put their foot down uh, when freshman Congress people say things which, and no matter what you feel about the Democratic Party, I know they upset you as well. They just say things that are inappropriate, upsetting. They, they remind us of anti-Semitic tropes from the past. And what Thane describes is what I hear people telling me all the time. It's a gr the fact that 107 Democratic Congress people had to make an issue. The fact that after Trump comes out, Trump is, c comes out with sayings about Israel, and next thing you know, there's some kind of congressional response, overwhelmingly Democrat, sometimes e entirely Democratic, that make people wonder whether the bipartisan support of Israel, which has been a bedrock of American foreign policy and to Israel's benefit, is in some way eroding. And so we want to hear what you have to say. 
In a sense, I'm, I'm stunned by the conversation. I also travel throughout the Jewish community. You and I are obviously going All the to, time, right. to different uh, places and talking uh, to different people. On December 7th, the President of the United States made comments that if said by any other major figure in, in the government or in the Congress would be immediately condemned as not only anti-Semitic but outrageously anti-Semitic. Can you should remind our audience? He talked about Jews as being basically as money grubbers and uh, people who would have to support him, whether they liked him or not, because otherwise the Democrats would take away uh, all of their money. And by the way, this isn't the first time that he's made comments along these lines. Uh, they were truly outrageous. Uh, we talk about anti-Semitic uh, tropes. Um, you know, historically, we once again uh, wouldn't hesitate for a second to unanimously and overwhelmingly condemn such statements. Um, but they haven't made it into the conversation here anywhere. And the difference between the President of the United States expressing such views and four freshman Congress people, I want to suggest to you, is a very, very significant difference. Yeah. But oh, just my immediate reaction is that kind of argument is, you know, you did something wrong. Oh, no, 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 somebody did something worse. I didn't hear you address whether what happens with Omar, Talib, and Cortez. I'll address that. Okay. Look, um, I condemn what they've said. Uh, I've condemned it in public, I've condemned it in my articles. Uh, these are uh, four people who hold views on Israel that I find utterly and completely unacceptable. Um, I think the problem is identifying the Democratic Party uh, with these four congressmen. I think I may have said on this program before, uh, I, I have had a conversation uh, with, uh, a, a, it was a confidential conversation, I won't mention his name, uh, with a, a, a congressman who said, it's extraordinary. There is something like, uh, there's a 40 or 50 freshman uh, Democratic congressmen uh, in, in the new Congress who were elected in 2018. The great majority of them are moderate on Israel, so, uh, supportive in a moderate sense, uh, in keeping with the traditional views of the Democratic Party. And he says, nobody pays any attention to what we say. Why is it that the media focuses so exclusively on these four women as if somehow they speak for the rest of us? And he was, he was furious, he was frustrated, and he was expressing, you know, his sort of... Because his, we don't hear any of the people that he's referring to look, respond look. and say, this is, if people spoke in the Democratic Party as you're speaking at this table, the issue wouldn't be on the table. Look at the resolution. To me, the key resolution that was passed uh, was, was uh, the resolution on the two-state uh, solution. That was a resolution that was put, for by, put forward by the Democratic Party. Uh, sadly and tragically, it ended up uh, being a partisan resolution. should not have been a partisan resolution. Expressed the views that have been the mainstream views of both Democratic and Republican administrations going back 50 years. It expressed strong support for the state of Israel. It expressed strong support for the large amounts of aid uh, that is given to Israel, initiated by President Obama. Uh, it, it should be said. It made a point of taking out the word occupation uh, that um, uh, one of these four congresswomen insisted was there. It was taken out. I'd, I'd like to put that resolution on this table and ask the people here, what do you, what do you think of this? Is this a pro-Israel pro resolution or not? Because that resolution expresses what is the consensus view of the Democratic Party. My view is it was a fine resolution. Okay. It was a pro-Israel resolution. Okay. And that, that uh, is, is, uh, should be the lens that we use to understand what is happening, okay. broadly speaking, in the, the Democratic Party. I think it's very important to hear your perspective. What I hear you saying, therefore, is at the moment, there's nothing, there, there are no movements inside the Democratic Party, no trends within the Democratic primary process as candidates run for president that. that troubles you. Of course, about the things that trouble me. Am I troubled by Bernie Sanders? 
Yes. I, I, well, I, I'm not anxious to run through candidate no, right. by candidate. But that's, for Sanders that's has, a different show. Sanders has been mentioned. And yes, I'm troubled by Sanders, it seems to me. Uh, I don't consider Sanders to be anti-Israel, but I do consider him to be wrong on Israel. I think his statements on Gaza are outrageous. He doesn't understand what's happening in Gaza at all. And uh, he's you know, made some analogies there that are, that are Okay, But bottom line, you are not concerned about the movement of the Democratic Party. I think, broadly speaking, the Democratic Party remains pro-Israel, favors a two-state solution, supports aid to, to Israel at current levels. And this notion, I think someone listening to your introduction, who had just arrived here from the moon, would assume that the Democratic Party is or is on the verge of becoming an anti-Israel party without a single mention of some of the problems that we have on the other side of the political spectrum, which is the other issue. And that does not only mean, by the way, the anti-Semitic comments by the President of the United States. It, it, it uh, refers specifically, in my view, to what's happening with Iran. For years, we spoke about Iran. We spoke about Iran at this table. Are, are, are the people at this table happy with what's uh, been going on with Iran? Three weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal, in its editorial, the Wall Street Journal said, let's admit the truth, Iran is closer to a nuclear bomb now than it was during the years of Obama. Why isn't that a concern? And why aren't we raising some of those issues and pointing the finger where it should be pointed, that is at a Republican administration that simply has failed to do the things that, that it needs to be doing and should be doing to assure Israel's security. Okay, again, I'm thrilled to have your perspective. Richard, what's your response to the issue that's now been raised by Thane and responded to by Eric? My response, Mark, uh, I don't want to disappoint you, but my response is to really not want to get into a discussion myself that is too much prone to being either pro-Democrat or pro-Trump. Um, I'm very I'm, concerned with... This has nothing with you're pro-Democrat. Right. The question I, is, what, I, what, I, you, I, how do you, what do you see as realistically happening here? Is Thane describing the reality more accurately than Eric? Or, I, or has Eric answered in a way that you feel is more realistic than Thane? I, I think both have important points to make, and I sort of am a little in the middle, although it's not what I really I'll want to talk about. I'll ask you differently. Are you worried about what the movement of the Democratic Party? I, I'm concerned about it. I don't want to exaggerate it. I think Eric is probably right that the core of the, the there is too much attention paid to these four freshman congresspersons. Um, they, they've been made much bigger than they would have to be because of all the attention. On the other hand, some of the stuff that they're saying is so insanely out, outrageous, anti-Semitic, and, and more directly anti-Semitic than virtually anything that's ever been said in the United States Congress. And when it has been said occasionally by other people, it's been universally condemned. I think that that's right, but I also agree with Eric that the, there's no hard evidence, even if we would prefer more uh, 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 intensive reactions by the Democrat leadership, Schumer, et cetera, Pelosi on down, Pelosi's been better actually, that, that uh, uh, against, these, against these statements, uh, the core of the Democratic Party is still uh, focused on, on quote, two-state solution with approving uh, aid to Israel, not conditional uh, with the Sanders, Warren, Buttigieg uh, uh, approach in, in, in a way that's, that's I'm not that alarmed by, although I'm very watchful because it is striking that this has been, that this has come up and has been so vocal and gotten so much attention. I hope it can be contained. Okay, let's not talk about the squad at all. To what extent does the letter signed by virtually half of the Democrats of in the House without one Republican in response to the acts of the statements which, interestingly enough, you say were the most significant events for you of 2019, having to do with saying settlements are no longer illegal or not I, viewed by the United States. I, I, I think to some... You, the, as has nothing to do with the squad. Okay. I want to know whether mm -hmm. that letter in any way upsets you in terms of it being a wholly democratic action. To some extent it does. Uh, 
not that I think it has an anti-Israel intention, but it could have an anti-Israel effect because I don't think that the, the dislike of the current president is so intense among Democrats and among some others that I think it makes it impossible to look at the constructive things that have been done with respect to Israel on an objective basis. Um, am, am I allowed to tell you what I think the, the what I think the real error in that in the statement is? Sure. Or do I have to talk about whether? No, that's sure. Okay. I, I think that. And which statement? On on the statement statement by the one hundred and one uh, objecting 107, to the, right? Yeah. The, if you look at what the Trump administration's statements have really meant, what I call the trilogy, the, the relocation of the embassy, the approval of the annexation of the Golan Heights, uh, and then the statement that settlements are not illegal. They are part of one message that someone has persuaded the president and his administration to deliver, and they are consistent. The message that they deliver is the one message that has to be delivered if there is ever going to be a peace agreement. And that is, the state of Israel is here to stay. It exists. It is legitimate. The conversation about how to settle the dispute between the Israelis and the Palestinians must begin with one premise, that the state of Israel exists legally and permanently as a Jewish state. Is in whatever, any, in whatever yes. borders. Is there any doubt that every administration has said that? There's no doubt that every administration has said it, but it's being, it has not been received on the Palestinian side. So that there is, I think, a message to the world in general and to the Palestinians in particular that the United States, which has supposedly told Israel that it had the right to pick its own capital and said it would put the capital in Jerusalem, finally has done it and said, wait a second, we're not scared of anybody's reaction, because the reaction against that, the, the hysteria that we have been worried that that would produce, is an hysteria based on the assumption that, wait a second, that's the last straw in acknowledging that Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish state. It's no predetermination of boundaries. It's in West Jerusalem. It's not in a part of Jerusalem that could possibly be in any contest. And it says, we'll leave that negotiation okay. to later. Was that, was, and that the same is true. was that a bipartisan decision? I think it was not a bipartisan decision. It was a, it was a, tr a Trump administration decision that was objected to by the Democrats, for, not because they're anti-Israel, because they're just wrong. I don't think there is adequate acknowledgement of what has stopped a peace from being made. You and I have talked about this, Mark. I, I, in, a, in a conversation we had once on, your, uh, on our station, um, you said, what's kept peace from happening? And I said, it's very obvious. And you almost jumped across the table to hug me. Yes, it's obvious. The Palestinians will not recognize in any boundaries that you're refighting, not 1967, but 1947 and 1948. And the world doesn't understand that. And it's very important that the United States administration has made that statement in several different ways. One was to say, you can have an embassy. And our embassy will be, will recognize your capital. You can make your capital in West Jerusalem. That doesn't predetermine what the boundaries of what, what, what will happen to any other part of Jerusalem. That's for negotiation. The Golan Heights doesn't seem to be in that category, but it is because there is no way in the world at this point that a secure Israel could exist. Anybody slightly objective has to understand that they cannot give back the Golan Heights and have a secure state of Israel. What any other place we could talk about, the Golan Heights, it's out of the question with what's going on in the north, with the amount of Iranian intervention, the amount of terrorism and so on. You cannot give those heights back and look down at the Israeli settlements of, uh, and have it in anyone's hands but, uh, but Israel's. And the same thing is true of the statement, which I keep repeating, the settlements are not illegal. Not this is a predetermination that the settle, that annexation is the right thing to do, not even that we would support annexation. But illegality, as Betty was uh, suggesting, illegality is totally incorrect and is a suggestion that Israel is an illegal entity. And consequently, we can go back and undo the law that was set in 1948 to make Israel a Jewish state. And this, I think, the, if you look at, the, at these things in that perspective, uh, the, the, the Trump administration 
for whatever reason, a theory brought about by whatever of Trump's aides who figured this out, it's been cogent and it's been forceful and it has delivered the message, stop playing around with the existence of a Jewish state and start negotiating about what can be negotiated about. And um, I think that the Democrats have failed to understand that without, without considering themselves uh, uh, anti-Israel. I think Obama failed to really understand it. Okay. And I by don't way, call I, Obama anti-Israel. Okay, and by the way, if I could, I would jump across this table and hug you again. <laughs> but I want to just, I just need a bottom line for you. Bottom line for you, I said to you, to what extent are you concerned about the movement within the Democratic Party? If you're saying to mm -hmm. me, Democrats are still as committed to Israel, they just got it wrong. That's different than people who are worried uh, that there is within the Democratic Party uh, a, a willingness to be anti-Israel. I think that there is a potential for the American left to become increasingly overtly anti-Israel as some of it already is and that I am concerned that that will seep into the Democratic Party. Very concerned. I'm just not ready to, to look at uh, everything the Democratic Party okay. does now in such a negative light. Betty, your comment on the same question. Okay, so first of all, I have said here before, and I still repeat, that I am loath to give up on the Democratic Party, and I agree uh, with what Eric said regarding the uh, 64 Democratic freshmen who, who were taken to Israel on the trip, who, who loved it and, and came back uh, uh, as gung-ho as anybody and as ever, and uh, the media did not pay attention. They did not get the exposure, and I feel that um, even in the Jewish media, we do much too much to uh, build up the other four, and that is a big problem. And I think we have to really look at that. Uh, we really have to look at that. And I think uh, what you said about the grown-ups in the party it is extremely uh, true that it is uh, that is what is worrisome that when people cross the line and uh, uh, say things uh, beyond that are beyond the pale uh, they are not uh, uh, called to task by the grown-ups in the party that is problematic and I think that uh, that uh, bodes well bodes poorly for, uh, for this um, that both poorly for the future. That is very worrisome. Bottom line, are you worried about the movement of the Democratic Party or not? I am worried about it. Okay. I wasn't as worried as I was last. I, I, I'm more worried than I was last year. Okay. But I would like to say something regarding uh, uh, what Richard said about um, Israel uh, as uh, the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state in the neighborhood that it is. I think it's more than that. I think that um, what, what was said here about a knee-jerk reaction to if the administration says one thing, then we have uh, another automatic opposite reaction in the Democratic Party, and that is troublesome. That's not about substance. That's not about anything real. That is about uh, the polarization, uh, uh, the political polarization in the country, the bitterness in the debates, and the unwillingness for people to listen to each other anymore. And that is truly terrifying. Um, and I would say something more about Israel, uh, that it is about not only the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state in its neighborhood, but it is about sovereignty that when you want to pick at the sovereignty, that's when you get what it, Richard was talking about, trying to dismantle this, that, and the other, and everything else. Our goal, I believe, for the Jewish community as a whole, no matter where we stand uh, party-wise, uh, our goal is to stand up, f advocate for Israel's right to be able to choose, to stand up for security so that she has the right to be able to choose what is good for her without pressure. Conditioning aid on whatever, whatever you want to condition it on, even if it is a two-state solution, it is not, that is not the holy grail of, uh, of our advocacy. The holy grail of our advocacy is to have Israel be able to choose freely to do what is right for herself as a democratically elected government of the state of Israel for her security. So that um, conditioning aid equals pressure. We have always said we do not believe in pressuring Israel. 
And as far as whatever peace agreement or how the peace agreement or whatever the parameters and the bottom line of the peace agreement will eventually be, that is between the parties, as mandated by UN resolutions. Not about what the Democrats think or the Republicans think. Okay. Well, okay, so you started this. Yeah, can I just add to that a little? Before you add, well, you, can, well, you can add anything you want. What I really want to do is I want to hear whether Eric was persuasive to you at all. <laughs> and, and he also mentioned Iran. And the three of the four of us, although I've <clears> talked <throat> to Richard about this many, many times off camera, the whole issue of Iran is something we've dealt with a long time. Prior to the Iran deal, that we, for a period of time, that's all we talked about here on JBS. Mm -hmm. But... Eric's point is, how come nobody's upset with what seems to be the reality that Iran is certainly seems to be closer to a, to a nuclear weapon than it was when Obama left office? And he says, you know, when you talk about all the issues, why isn't that part of it? So I'm asking you, first of all, when you hear Eric, was he persuasive at all? If so, why? If not, why? Well, let's go to Iran for a moment. I thought among the five of us, the irony is that it was Eric who wanted to talk about Iran. Correct. Uh, and I agree with him. Yeah, no, but I'm sorry because I was with Eric over a number of years here on these, these mm -hmm. stations in which he was supporting the Iran deal. And so for him to now say, look, this is our real problem. No, but he's saying he supported the deal. You should he, not have been supporting the deal. Just, no, wait, 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 wait. That was oh, the oh, point, oh, oh, Eric. Oh, oh, okay. If you no, weren't no, supporting on, the on, deal, we would on, be here hold today. On, right hold here. on, hold on, hold <laughs> on. Eric's point is... Right. That he supported the Iran deal. And it, absurdly he did. And it only <clears throat> fell apart when Trump withdrew. It's Trump's withdrawal that has led Iran to come closer to the bomb. That, am I correct, Eric? Ludicrous. Why is that ludicrous? <laughs> Just ludicrous. I, did I miss, I, I'm did, saying did that... Did I misstate your position? Trump has mishandled Iran policy uh, to Israel's detriment. Um, How? Because when he pulled out, yes. he had no plan B. Okay, that's what. So, from Eric's perspective, we're in this position now because Trump pulled out of the deal. We're without in a, out of plan B. It's not clear that the plan B was not the sanctions that are now exactly. producing a dis, uh, an unrest exactly. in, in Iran. Exactly. We now. have. What do you, oh, there's no, not I, a. I, but he said from the beginning, I'm going to pull out. <laughs> I'm going to impose sanctions. He did. Those sanctions are going to be tough. They have been. Yes. They have been. They're going to come back to the table, and we're going to renegotiate the deal. That never happened. What, what he didn't say is, what happens if they don't come back to the table? What happens if they become more By resolute? The way, nobody said that. Nobody had an answer for that, including Obama. Nobody. What happens if, in fact, they respond to those sanctions by... Uh, bombing the oil, the oil fields in Saudi Arabia and shooting down uh, American drones. What happens if they respond to the sanctions by uh, returning to the enrichment of uranium? If you're going to pull out of the deal and you're going to uh, uh, put on additional pressure, you have to have answers to those questions. Or else what you're going to end up with uh, is what we have now. An Iran which is closer now to a bomb than it was That's before. That's what he's saying. Yeah. That's and, what I'm saying. And we also have a country that recognizes that we are beyond a Cold War with Iran. And let's just be honest, instead of being liars like in the Obama administration, let's just have an Iran deal and uh, Iranians, if you send them a good year message every year, they won't want global hegemony. What, what we're having now <clears throat> is at least a realistic recognition that we are to some degree at war with Iran and we're seeing skirmishes, mm -hmm. we're seeing proxies all over the region. There is sort of a war again with Iran. A total and, misread. <clears throat> Trump, the, the, Trump is, let me suggest to you, an openly isolationist president. Uh, I think <clears throat> his, his foreign policy in general is a mess, <clears throat> but to the extent that there is a, an ongoing theme that you can point to and find evidence for, it is that he's an isolationist president. Nobody, on the one hand, he blusters about military might, but in fact never uses it. But we've and sent battleships thing. into the region oh, to protect the oil for other Gulf states. It's not that we've done Didn't. nothing. We have taken we have steps. We have taken steps to call out Iranian aggression in that region. With all due respect, we have not. 
Okay. Was, there was I think that about... when you send battleships in that are also aircraft carriers, when you expose the Iranian sabotaging of oil wells, this that would have never happened in the Obama administration. He couldn't have bent over backwards for the mullahs. He would do anything for the mullahs. And you, on this show, were supporting the Iran deal. So you're, 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 okay. the, you're the last person who should ever say the word Iran. You should never say Why? the word Iran. I don't understand. In, in don't say Iran. Iran instead, is not your word. So instead of talking about Persia, the, the current Persia. reality, say Iranian and, carpets. And, and the current dangers, which have been pointed out on the, on the right, including by the Wall Street Journal, which says we need to do something concrete. And blustering rhetoric is not sufficient. You would like to go back and talk about Obama again for the 15th time, and that's fine. Because he I was want, an embarrassing president, I, I want the worst that. foreign policy president yes, in the history. That's not about 2019. It's not about 2019. But this is how we got here. Right now, the responsibility for dealing with Iran and the threat that it poses rests with President Trump and with his administration. And I want to suggest to you, there has not been a consistent policy, and B, isolationism is the major theme uh, of, of his okay. approach to the Can world. I just go no, back no, you can't now, because you're right. No, I will you come back. insisted I will that we come, go to Iran. I, no, I did not. I did not insist at all. And you went there first. Iran. Is, has Trump made Iran worse for Israel? I don't think so, but sometimes it worries me when he talks about um, about having more conversations with Is Iran. Is Iran closer approaching. to a nuclear weapon now? Than I don't know the answer to that. It was it was stated that way in the Wall Street Journal, but I don't know if that's a consensus. I happen to think that if the treaty had still been in place, they'd be getting closer to exactly. the exactly not possibly exactly. have been trusted, and and we would not have adequately detected it. I worried terribly. I hated that treaty. There's no question about it. They are the biggest problem for us in the world, the biggest problem for America, biggest problem for the Middle East by far in the world, although sometimes I think theologically that they are also uniting the rest of the Middle East against them and that that is inuring to Israel's potential ultimate benefit, and that's the way God works sometimes. And by the way, that is a reason, I suspect, when you're seeing more belligerency with Iran, is what you're seeing is by decertifying the Iran deal, and reapplying the, uh, uh, the, the sanctions against them. And the Bahrain conferences and the various solicitations that mm -hmm. the United States and Israel has had with the Gulf states, the uniting of the United Emirates, Saudi Arabia, everyone knows the evil of Iran. And, and, the, that's, and you're missing and that's, and and the, and that's, Betty, piece. Betty, you got a chance here. And that's exactly where we want Iran to be. We are missing a crucial piece here of, uh, of, of who is responsible for a lot of the problems in, with, regarding Iran, and that is Europe. It is not only about America and, and Israel and the Gulf. This is about Europe's failure to really understand that Iran also is developing missiles that can not only uh, attack Israel, but can also reach Europe and beyond. And Europe has its head in the sand. They are doing all everything they can to try to evade the American sanctions, to violate the American sanctions. You can point to France and Germany and Switzerland and Italy and other European countries who still invest, buy, purchase, uh, and are big customers of Iran. And this is a total hypocrisy on their part. It is totally destabili uh, destabilizing, and it is a finger in the eye of their American ally. Oh. And, and, it is, uh, and it makes a big difference in the economy and what, we're, and what okay. the sanctions are trying to achieve. I appreciate the added mm -hmm. dimension. Now answer for me. Big piece, piece did, Donald, did Donald Trump make things worse? in terms of Iran's getting a nuclear weapon? No. No. Well, you heard what Eric said. How do you answer it? I said ludicrous, right? No. That's not All right. fair. Let, let, me, let, let me suggest. What about the Kurds? In other well, words, Thane is suggesting they're taking a, a, you know, a tough position. They're asserting themselves in the, in the Middle East and so on. Trump decided to... Uh, By the way, all are individual issues. All right. To, They're uh, all individual. All right, and I, I think you're I, right when you talk about him being an isolationist. Abandon, but, but abandoning wait. the Kurds, uh, turning towards mm -hmm. Erdogan, who is anti-Israel. But more than that, more than that, what's happening in Lebanon? What's happening in Iraq? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Iran has continued to provide pre precision uh, missile 
uh, well, the money to, they receive uh, uh, from the United States. Thank you, has, Mark. Has continued to provide precision uh, um, uh, uh, missiles to to Hezbollah. Uh, Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. um, there have been uh, missile installments in in uh, Iraq. Not to mention what has happened in Syria. Well, right now, the major power in Syria is Russia. It's not the United States. Because we've essentially, you know, uh, okay, but uh, but part our, of my problem our hands is, of all that. So I'm problem is, I've, got, I've got the four take of you. Take the broad I picture. Need, I need to keep this as narrowly focused as possible. All right. The issue was you, we talked about Iran. You started it by saying Iran, again, is an enormous threat to the state of Israel. And Eric feels that Trump has made things worse. Sure. I asked Eric, I'm sorry, I asked Thane, whether he agrees or disagrees with, with Eric, you got very upset with him. But that, that, that is. Well, because I have a good memory of the Iran deal and the discussions we I, had I think around this table. I understand Eric's position was Trump made a very bad mistake by pulling out and not having a backup plan. And what Richard just said was he doesn't think it would matter whether we did pull out or not, and you agree with him. Of course. Okay. Have, we're not going to solve Iran right I, now. now. I'm going to come now back. Can I just? You, you heard what uh, Eric said about his defense of the Democratic Party, uh, yeah. and that must be addressed, and then we'll move on to other issues. So let me briefly respond to that. Um, I think we're not spending enough time, and you did, by the way, with the, the letter with the 107 congressmen. To me, that is highly significant. And the reason for it is it's because the very points that Richard Stone made at this table that he sees, I, I forgot you called it a trilogy of decisions that were made. What you're seeing with the 107 congressmen is a rejection. It's not just the illegal settlements. They Correct. roll down. Correct. They roll down everything that Trump did in connection with Israel and the Palestinians. Correct. Like what is defunding uh, the Palestinian Authority the Taylor Force Act, right? The various ways in which the uh, United States is saying to the Palestinians, we are not going to subsidize your terrorism. We know you like it and you're good at it, but that's not what we do. If you want to rebuild, if you want to build a nation in Gaza, we're with you. If you want rockets and tunnels, we're not with you. So you know what, the PLO base in Washington DC, get the hell out. They literally shut the door. Because it, it's a terrorist office. It didn't belong to be open. The Palestinian Authority is corrupt. They're using the money, diverting the money to pay to incentivize the killing of Israelis uh, through, uh, through insurance policies, stipends, payments, education benefits. The United States is saying, we don't spend money on that. Now, these are very strong statements that the United States has made, and they were gigantic leaps away from administrations that are prior. Richard Stone is saying at the table, saying, well, I think this is a trilo these trilogies. Well, the 107 congressmen are saying, we want to roll that back. Mm -hmm. We want to roll that back. We kind of like it better when Israel's self-determination is not so determined. Where we liked it better when the idea that a Jewish state doesn't have to exist. We like it better when you give money to terrorists to conduct their terrorism. That's what the 107... Now, I admit, some of those names, I mean, they're imbeciles. They don't know. They just don't know. They don't know their history. They don't know to them the word sound. They don't even know that the State Department ever, never actually said in its original uh, opinion that the settlements that were illegal. illegal. It, they said that it's inconsistent with international mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. And as uh, 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 my colleague, as well as also a law professor, knows, that's in itself, in its inception, that's not saying it's illegal. Right. And then three years later, Ronald Reagan stepped in and said, it's not illegal. What else did he say? So, so, but, mm -hmm. but, but, so what, what I think is significant about the letter, which demonstrates the shift in the Democratic Party, is that 107 people signed a letter saying, that Israel's capital shouldn't be where they said it is, and that the Golan Heights should be given back to the Syrians, that the, that the settlements are absolutely illegal, which means, again, occupation is the word that we tag Israel with, as if they are morally censored as an occupying power. Um, and, uh, and when it comes to, my last point is, when it comes to Eric's, um, 
secondary resolution that came out, was it last week, right, Eric, that was the one that supported the two states. And I'm not even sure. First of all, you know, one of the things that we haven't mentioned, the four members, the freshman senators, they didn't sign that one. They didn't sign it. Yeah. You know why the they don't? You know why I don't sell it? The word one state solution. solution. The word, it's not just that. They don't want, they don't two believe, states. they don't believe two states. They're not, not true. They, don't accept, them don't they don't accept the concept that there should be a Jewish homeland. So then why should we sign a letter of that? But what I am saying is even the, set, the congressman persons who signed the second petition, if, you're on, if your only imagination for the Middle East is to return to the two-state model, you're not pro-Israel. Okay. Because that is already a failed model that hasn't worked. Something else has to happen. But the, it, but the Palestinians are not interested in a state I, where they're I, neighboring with Jews. I, I think they're only interested in their state where they get to live in Tel Aviv and in Haifa. In 107, yeah. I heard you say this, uh, you believe that 107 Democratic congressmen do not believe that there should be a Jewish state? I believe that they no. don't understand. No. Right. They don't it's understand. Ignorance. Yeah, it's that's not what I said. That's I said, what I said, I said earlier. The word it's not imbecile. bad will. Most of them it's literally don't know Let's what they're doing. Let's go back to Ronald Reagan. They just signed a letter. Let's go back to Ronald Reagan. Go back to Ronald, Reagan. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan said, you're right, <laughs> that we shouldn't look upon the settlements <clears throat> as illegal. And I think that's an appropriate and legitimate point to make. He then said, however, they're an obstacle to peace. And that, in fact, that, in fact, is the heart of the matter. Not that they're illegal, because who knows whether they're illegal under inter international law, does international law even exist? But Ronald Reagan said, George Bush said, they are, in fact, an obstacle to peace. Okay, well, Eric, do you believe that the settlements are the reason that the uh, Palestinians have not been ready to acknowledge the existence of a Jewish state? No, and I, I, I don't believe they're the primary reason that they, they haven't, mm -hmm. and their failure to recognize the state is, in but fact, because, the heart of the Because the matter. world but does that, believe that. But that does not make additional settlements in some areas at least a good idea. Do you believe that every settlement no, no, and no. every outpost that, no, outpost no, that goes never, up I said is very, a good idea? Absolutely not. All right. But so, there have been none in but that's not what this, that's not what this resolution was about. True. It's and not it's, what this resolution was about. This resolution was about the discussion should not be about illegality, which is a suggestion of the illegitimacy of the Jewish state, the way many other issues, including BS. Stuart, Stuart Eisenstadt made a very good statement, a very good statement. He said, look, the, the, the illegality issue has unfortunately become the center of the discussion when it's not the central question. The question here was, was the Trump administration, by virtue of this action, encouraging Israel to increase its settlement activity in uh, new areas of the West Bank. I don't think so. And, all right. I don't my, think so. My, my answer is, it's unclear. And his statement was made at a time when Benjamin Netanyahu, in the midst of, a, of an election campaign, was talking about a new effort to annex parts of the West Bank which he had not, over the course of the last 13 yeah. years, made any effort I, uh, I, uh, to annex. I really, so there was at least a suspicion that one of these phenomena uh, was uh, tied to the other. And that, was, that, to me, was the heart of the matter. If it had, had, had simply been uh, uh, focused solely and, and exclusively on legality issues, but in the political context, it could reasonably be taken to suggest that they were promoting annexation above and beyond what, what we have uh, I, I've, seen up well, to now. I've said, I, see it, I see it a different way. I've seen it as consistent with their approach all along, which has been to deliver the message to the world in general, the Palestinians in particular, stop fighting the existence of a Jewish yeah, state. I, I uh, don't I do it in illegality. I, I, I want to say what I, yeah. the, a mantra that I have here on JBS. I don't believe the settlements have one thing to do, not one thing to do, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I believe if every settlement was taken down tomorrow, we'd be no, not one iota closer to peace with the Palestinians. And the reason is, and we all know it, the Palestinian leadership, I'm not talking about Palestinians, Palestinian mm -hmm. leadership has, is, is wedded to an Islamic fundamentalist ideology that says all the land that was once under 
the Islamic sovereign control must remain under sovereign mm -hmm. control of Islam, and no infidel, infidel, especially a Jewish infidel, but no infidel, will ever have sovereignty in our land. And that land at the moment r runs from the river to the sea. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing you hear the Palestinian leadership talking about. Let me finish. From the river to the sea. As long as they say from the river to the sea, there's nothing that can be done. And there's no, it's not a territorial dispute. It's not a boundary issue to the Palestinian. There's no difference between the land on one side of the green line or the other the side of the green line. And so if Jews took out every settlement, and there's a different issue about how does it look in terms of, of world opinion and do Jews want to do it, but the argument should be in those terms, not in terms of it is preventing or in any way is contributing to the lack of peace. And I want to say, well, let, well, one last thing, and then I'll, I will, again, I will let you listen. I will listen to you. <laughs> that I agree with Richard and with Thane. I was very upset by this letter that was signed by 107 Democrats. And it's not simply that they were affirming a two-state solution, which, by the way, it seems to me is no yes. longer realistic. But that's a, for, we'll have that discussion during the year, the extent to which the two-state solution remains an, a, a real solution. If it's not a real solution, what in the world is a solution? But the, the statement said, and I was on a program with Thane and a very articulate Israeli, Benjamin Anthony, mm -hmm. and for him this was the worst part of it, and I hadn't understood it till he said it. The worst part was that the Democrats said Israeli policy on the West Bank endangers the security Obvious. of America. Unbelievable. He considered it to be a blood libel, and that what it does is it whips up a certain kind of fervor anti-Israel sentiment, which is wholly inappropriate and unwarranted. So that for me, there are two clear statements. Number one, factually, there is, there has never been illegality attached to the settlements, ever. There's no, this land does not belong to anyone. If the Palestinians have a right to live in it, so do you, and so do I. And if the settlements are illegal, if they're Israeli, then, Maral, then uh, Ramallah is also illegal, because nobody should be living there. And second, I don't want America, whether it's Democrats, Republicans, at the moment, it's being said by Democrats. That's just the reality. I don't want to hear members of our government saying anything that right. disparages the legitimacy or the stature of the State of Israel. That's what I hear at the moment. And, you know, if at one point it was only the squad. And my answer then was, then where are the grown-ups? Now it's the grown-ups, too. They, these are grown-ups who signed this 107. Virtually half the Democrats in Congress piled on. Incidentally, somebody here, you, you said, I'm not going to give you the name. I'm going to do the same thing, although I hate it. Uh -huh. I'm talking about, we contacted a Democratic congressman. And we said to the Democratic congressman's office, by the way, you don't pick up the phone and the congressman answers. Right. And we said, would you explain why he signed this letter? They said he didn't sign the letter. He never signed the letter. Well, we said, thank you for your time. We went back, and there was a signature. So we called back. His signature is there. Oh, is it? Is it? And I know how life works. Life works. Somebody says, sign this. What is it? Oh, it's a get. Okay, fine. And I don't believe this congressman read it. It happens all the time. People sign petitions they haven't read. And then one day someone says to them, somebody says to them, what in the world are yeah. you signing? And they said, what, 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 what are you talking about? This. Oh, oh. Uh, I believe some of the 107 may have been just like the congressman we contacted. But the fact that this congressman would do it, because for him it wasn't about the detail of, the, of what was in it, it was that 
The Democratic Party, members of the 106 of his colleagues were saying, you know what? What Trump okay. did, it was mm -hmm. anti-Trump. What Trump did, totally Trump moved agree. the embassy. If Obama had moved the embassy, the Jewish world would be, they would be naming statues after him. If, Trump, if, if Obama said, the, the, you know, I was wrong, the settlements are not, not illegal. Boy, he never said they were legal. They are not illegal. He'd be lionized. If, if the Golan Obama, Heights, the go, annex the Golan Heights, and you so, can't afford and, not and to. And I have rabbis telling me this, reform rabbis, conservative rabbis, right deed, wrong person. Mm -hmm. As if because it was done by Trump, whom they hate in a way that I, it's, they may hate him more than Hitler. It is amazing to me. Well, more than Nixon. I, more no, than no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, let me say this. Nixon, I that. <laughs> but with, that, that's not even the same ballpark anymore. <laughs> I'm telling mm -hmm. you, people who didn't live through Hitler, they talk about him in a way that they even don't talk about the Hitler they didn't live with. It's just mm -hmm. insane. Listen to how, how Thane was talking about Obama. Yeah. Listen to how Thane no. was talking about Obama. And you know Obama. why? Listen because you're not the, allowed to say what I just listen, said. That's no, not true. <laughs> Nobody Jewish, talks like why the Jewish community. Eric, why is that relevant? Nobody's allowed to say why what I just said. Why is it that he's right. worse, too? No, 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 just I, I, the, I, the attitude, I'm, my yes, question, I'm just trying I'm, to I'm show trying you. I'm trying to suggest that, that, that this is I'm trying to show you why is it that there are many thoughtful, committed Jewish Democrats who are scared... I have a, I'm an adult study session. I'm sitting with well-educated, liberal, liberally oriented Jews who love Israel. And, the, and I didn't even lead them. I don't lead them. I didn't ask them. It came out that there is a fear about what's happening in their Democratic Party that they never imagined possible. It would be maybe helpful, by the way, for me to for me to bring you in, and for them to hear your right perspective, because I believe you articulated very well. What I don't think you realize is the extent to which what is real inside the Democratic Party, whether it's on the fringes or whether now it's less so with this letter of 107, and then this latest letter that's criticizing Trump again. It it's not only giving the appearance which the Jewish tradition takes very seriously. It also is sending a message about where their Democratic Party is. And, and at least I would want a recognition on your part that although it may be misplaced, yes, I realize it's there. Well, look, I've, I've recognized that there are elements in the party that are saying distressing things and that I haven't, been hesitate to, I haven't hesitated to condemn. Uh, look, what I want to say is the following. We've had a number of people dismissing the, the two-state solution here. I want to su su suggest to you, I, I see myself in this way. I'm a Zionist. And Zionism is about a Jewish and democratic state. And in the absence of a two-state solution, there is nothing on the table put forward by anybody, any party, that explains how we're going to have a Jewish and democratic state in the land of Israel. Well, that's that's oh, okay. Again, that's not what I want this to be about. Fine. We will. We will. But I, I will I bring you take back. Note of those people who have sort of blight of you know this tendency to sort of blithely say that's kind of an irrelevant issue. We'll deal with it later, as if it is not at the very heart of the Zionist discussion, and in fact has been from the very beginning. I don't know that uh, but, anybody... But, never but, talking about the know. onus on the Palestinians. Yeah. No one ever talked about sure. the right. onus on the Palestinians. Of course there's an onus on the Palestinians. I don't, I don't hear anybody here <laughs> saying they don't favor a two-state solution. Right. What you heard at this table is... That there's that not going to be one. That it, right. That, there's that unless some, some radical change occurs, change in the radical change occurs in the leadership, there it cannot happen one. now. And to press the idea of a two-state solution right now is to deny Israel the right to 
negotiate for its own security. You have to keep the option open so I, it doesn't become I agree. an impossibility but, in the but future. But you don't have to but stick that, it in Israel's face right now as something that should happen. Or, or imply that it's Israel's fault. Israel it's not and, Israel's fault. And and to say that's that, again, no, no, it's, it's not clear. It's not Israel's fault. Nor is the, nor, the fault nor, of nor settlements. Nor did I ever say it was Israel's fault. And, and settlements, what I'm suggesting, if you continue to settle, Year after year, the possibility of a two-state solution simply diminishes. It that was saved. once true, and that is that still was true. One, no. That is still true. No, we were. I mean, wrong. you know, we, <laughs> we didn't understand. Betty said, you know, there's been, there's been one new settlement. All right, you know, if you look at, at Benjamin Netanyahu's, you know, most recent tenure, he says, and he's right, there's been one new settlement that he's put up. That's all. However, there have been 26 outposts. Outposts. What's an outpost? A settlement. It's an illegal settlement. It's a settlement that is not legal under And that the Israeli Supreme laws. Court of Israel will take down. And Correct. That's right. That can be That's taken right. down, but in which, in the interim... They're probably doing it right now. It would, there are 26 standing Yes, uh, none of them initiated there. by the government. No, but the government allows them. If they no, set up an allowing. Not, not, not only a matter of, of allowing them, but supports they're them. They're not relevant. They don't. It, of course, they're not relevant. They're not relevant. They're uh, not. We're, we're in, 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 in. We see it very differently, don't we? <laughs> we do. <laughs> <laughs> Settlements right. are happening. Listen, Settlements are I expanding. Have, I have to say this to the four of you. Yeah. It's amazing how fast time flies. I am so sorry. We must interrupt our discussion. Um, and we will simply pick up some of the issues that we haven't even touched yet in our second part, which we air next week. But I say this all the time. I, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for always thank being you, Mark. here. Eric, thank you for always being here. Betty, thank you for thank always you. being here. And Richard, it is so wonderful. And you'll always be here, Richard, as long as you want to be. <laughs> okay, there you have it. Part one of our year-end retrospective. We will be continuing this discussion next time, so I hope you're with us when we, uh, when we get into part two and a lot of the issues which were part of the year we haven't even touched yet. But I hope, as always, you enjoy hearing Richard Stone, Betty Ehrenberg, Eric Yaffe, Thane Rosenbaum, and their insights, whether you agree with them or disagree with them. I hope they also make you think, and I always invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts, comments, reactions, to any of the things any of the four panelists have said or anything that I've said as well, please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. And remember, you can also now take L'Chaim with you everywhere you go on the L'Chaim podcast. Just download, and you can listen to this whole discussion over and over and over again. <laughs> and so until the next time... I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. And we're especially pleased to remind you that thanks to a generous matching gift from the Cayley family, every new or increased dollar you donate to JBS will be worth double to JBS. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.